The Portfolio Composer, episode 193. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now, for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. All my jobs, every single one of them comes to me because of a referral. So I have to kind of be on people's radar long enough for them to see what I do, hear my music, and then ultimately many years down the line or many months down the line, an opportunity for referral just presents itself, and that's when I'm referred. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Just released, Dorico Pro 2 is a major new version, including features for musicians working in film and TV music and in jazz, rock, and pop. Steinberg have also released Dorico Elements, a new entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Hello and welcome to The Portfolio Composer. I am your host, your coach, your teacher, Garrett Hope, and I couldn't be more excited that you're listening to this podcast. This is a podcast that's helping composers answer the question, what does it mean to be a composer in the 21st century and how do we do that? So often discussions revolve around marketing, business practices, networking, communication, and building relationships because we are in a relationship business. And that is how you get referrals. That is how you build your career. It's more about who you know than what you know, but you do have to know how to write music first and foremost. I'm very pleased to introduce all of you today to film and media composer Penka Kuneva. She is known across Hollywood as an exceptionally talented composer and artist of uncommon passion. Her credits include the games The Mummy VR and Prince of Persia. A NASA theme park, Heroes and Legends, and the independent features, Aga, Devil's Whisper, and the sci-fi drama, Encounter. The top label, Varis Saraband, released her Woman Astronaut and Rebirth of Id orchestral albums to worldwide acclaim. She scores films, video games, and emerging media. I think you're going to get a lot out of this really fascinating conversation. Enjoy. I hear a dog in the background. Do you have puppies? Oh, just one dog. I, uh, yeah, just one puppy, but... She's very loud. Yeah. I'm a dog person. I grew up with dogs, and I just think they're the best. They're the best. I love our dogs. Yeah. Tell me how you came to be a composer. So I grew up with storytelling. My parents and grandparents were great storytellers. So since my early childhood, telling stories was a big thing in our house. I started playing the piano when I was a child, and um, age six, um, I loved theater so how I started composing, my mother had a friend who was a producer of a children's theater show, and that woman, the producer, thought it would be cute to have like a little girl playing the piano on stage for the kids. So she actually commissioned me to write these very short piano pieces for her kids' show, and I played matinees every Saturday morning for a year and started getting paid at the age of 12 as a composer, pianist for theater. So that gave me a sense of identity. And I started calling myself, I'm a composer, I write music, and I just kept composing. Uh, It was fun to do and kind of gave me a real sense of who I was as a child. And I just kept up with it and started entering my music into competitions. When I was 17, I got into a Japanese competition for young songwriters. My song won the Grand Prix. And at that point, I pretty much decided, well, I'm going to be a composer. That big question of life got figured out for me. And then I had to figure, then I immigrated from Bulgaria, my native country, to the United States to study composition on a fellowship, graduate fellowship. And I went to Duke University. Oh, okay. When I finished Duke, the big question became, how would I now build a professional career and what is the best match for me? Yeah, I'm going to stop you though. I have a few questions I want to dig into. Yeah. So you basically were a professional composer at the age of 12. Well, I mean, I got paid as a composer, but the music was like, you know, derivative piano pieces. Well, of course. I have a daughter now who is almost 12 and she's very much into anime and uh, 
manga, and this kind of gives her a sense of identity, and she wants to learn Japanese. And I realized this is exactly what was going on with me when I was her age or a little bit older, because just being a composer, calling myself composer, gave me a sense of who I was. I was a shy, uh, awkward, kind of bookish type. I've always been nerdy, and composing really became my sort of way of expressing myself and that kind of sense of deeper identity. Oh, okay. And when you were at Duke, were you doing a more traditional conservatory style classical concert music education? Yeah, I had two fantastic, very inspiring mentors, Stephen Jaffe and Scott Lindroth. They both are orchestral composers, but the most important attitude at Duke is that everybody was encouraged to find their best, most authentic voice as an artist. And that's like the whole vibe that you basically are encouraged to find who you are and sky's the limit. So they very much encourage experimenting and trying out things. So I was at Duke in the early 90s. I started in 1990. And the whole vibe was, okay, postmodernism, let's combine ideas from popular culture with heady intellectual music or different historical periods or different cultures. And because I come from Eastern Europe, I also always had a huge, big interest in non-Western traditions like Indian music or just different non-Western music. So my interests were really very much in harmony with the kind of training I got at Duke and the overall attitude of encouraging individuality and authentic voice and personal style. And it was just the perfect place for me to be. Oh, that's wonderful. And you said that when you graduated, you were then faced with this question, how do I build a career? How did you begin to even answer that? I basically understood that this was a very important crossroad and I had to make the right choice. I've always loved storytelling and theater. I've loved film. I didn't know how technically one composes for film, but I also have enjoyed working with people. I really love collaborating. Like I've collaborated with theater directors since I was in my teens. So that kind of whole process of working with somebody else's ideas comes very naturally to me. So I thought to myself, well, I'm going to pack my bags and go to Hollywood like anybody else with a dream and really zero business acumen, which I wish I had, but I didn't have. So that's how I came to Hollywood, just understood storytelling is what I do best. My music is naturally dramatic, naturally storytelling. I work with people well, and I wanted to be in a collaborative environment where I compose music for films and visual media. I want to stop you for a second and follow up on something you just said that was really interesting. You said you had no business acumen. What were some of the hard lessons that you had to learn? That's a big question. That sort of entrepreneurial attitude where you're proactive, you cultivate relationships, you're very outgoing, you attend events, is something I didn't understand until much later. I mean, I've always been very intuitive about how I wanted to build my career and my life. But I didn't have like the breakdown of, you know, you attend events, you cultivate relationships, you surround yourself with peers, people who are just as driven as you are. You know, you try out many projects, you understand there is a gigantic attrition in relationships. Like you have to have 1,000 friends for three of them to make a movie and for one of them to actually hire you because you're a good fit. And I didn't understand that kind of more of a business aspect of building a career as a freelance artist. So that's one thing and that took me a long time to learn and it really took years because I didn't have mentors and that's one of the reasons I mentor young composers a lot because it's just my desire to help them with a shortcut of something that took me a long time to learn precisely what it means to be an entrepreneur, artist in a career that really takes not just one skill set but a number of skill sets, you know, being an entrepreneur, running your own business, being an artist, you know, being very technically savvy, which is something we all learn every day because of technology changes, being very proactive in terms of building relationships and cultivating relationships. So that's the lack of business savvy. I came to Hollywood and really took me a long time to learn. Yeah. You know, I've faced the same problem because I came out of academia and I had the same questions. So I'm curious, how do you define entrepreneurship? from the perspective of being a composer? 
The most important thing I have to do all the time is build relationships, cultivate relationships, let people know about my music in a very organic way. And most young composers kind of just go to events and start shoving business cards into people without connecting, without having connected on a personal level. But before we were composers, we are human beings and we are, you know, friends and people tend to resonate with certain people more than others. And one thing that I try to do is I try to meet a lot of people because with some people I resonate naturally, you know, temperamentally, in terms of taste, in terms of style, and with other people I don't. I've worked with people in terms of having jobs where there was no chemistry or no resonance, and it's kind of harder, and ultimately these jobs don't lead anywhere in the future. But the people who energize me, and I energize them and their projects, these are the kind of jobs that propel the artist forward. And these are the kind of jobs that lead to future jobs and future introductions. And all my jobs, every single one of them comes to me because of a referral. So I have to kind of be on people's radar long enough for them to see what I do, hear my music, and then ultimately many years down the line or many months down the line, an opportunity for referral just present itself and that's when I'm referred and of course I don't get many of the jobs I uh, you know demo and we do bids and but I only get a certain amount of the jobs I get referred to because it's a very competitive field and everybody else refers their friends also but what I do now which I should have been doing many years ago is just being really proactive with building cultivating organically friendships you know, genuine human relationships where I connect with people first on a human level as friends and people who have taste because all artists ultimately fall back on their taste. They want the kind of music they like, the kind of music that they feel is going to work for their film because of the kind of movies they've watched. So one of my jobs, really important jobs, is to understand their taste very deeply because whatever I deliver is going to have to fit with that test taste and expectations. So these are all the kind of very subtle sort of things in building a business as a freelance artist. And I think it's applicable to everybody. I mean, to anybody who is a content creator, artist in a freelance business, they all have to do that. They all have to cultivate relationships and let people know of their latest credits and let people know their latest work and send emails and host parties and invite friends. This is what everybody is doing. It's a very dynamic, very proactive business that we have to build. And ultimately, a tremendous amount of effort goes and very few jobs materialize. But then this is a starry moment when a fabulous job materializes. And this is the kind of job that propels us forward. Right. What are your best practices for building these organic friendships, because you described yourself as a very introverted young woman. And I think a lot of composers might identify themselves as being introverted as well. And they just get cold feet at the idea of having to network and talk to people that they don't know. So how did you handle that? And how do you build these relationships that can be so rewarding? I go to a lot of functions, a lot of trade shows, parties. Like I never miss a party. If I get invited, I always go. Even if I'm like busy or something, I make time to go. But one thing I have understood over the years, the first and foremost thing I need to do is connect to people on a humanistic level. So I don't talk about my work. I talk about their dreams because there's this understanding that everybody who is in this town has a dream. Everybody who's in this town is driven by some kind of passion. And then I turn it into my job to learn about them. So I ask them questions. I get them to talk about their projects. And then I'm, I'm very intuitive. I'm very sensitive to people's energy. And when I feel that some kind of question energizes them, then I ask them more questions like that. Everybody likes to talk about their projects, about their ideas. And when I sense that, Somebody's just kind of energized by something I've said, because you can sense it in the conversation, then I just kind of basically allow them to speak about something that makes them excited. But it's all connecting on a human level, um, deeply personal level. I'm not afraid to talk about personal subjects myself, and I'm also very respectful of people's boundaries. I'll just tell you a quick story. This is all kind of very abstract. But one time I went to a game conference, and that was a conference for producers, and I didn't know anybody. And most of the uh, people were guys. So at dinner, I sat down, 
at the table, like for 10 people, and like I was the only woman, everybody else was these, you know, people who've come from different backgrounds. You now there's one guy who's military and writers and just different people who are at the table. So the whole time we talked about like Russian spies and the Cold War, completely unrelated to jobs or music or can you hire me to score your game? No, that didn't even come as a question. But I was talking about what I thought would be interesting. Actually, it was me who suggested the idea. I mean, the conversation just kind of got started because I told them I'm from Bulgaria. So they're like, oh, you know, Cold War and Russia and behind the Iron Curtain. So that's how the whole dinner conversation got started. And a couple of months later, the producer, who was my friend's kind of acquaintance, hired me on a job. But I never, I mean, he knows I'm a composer. He knows I'm a freelancer. So the assumption is that I'm always looking for jobs. But I didn't say, oh, please hire me on your game. Instead, we talked about Russian spies. So I guess he understood that he could relate to me on a human level and I'm approachable. And I got a job. And the job was wonderful. It was just tremendous. And that's how I get my jobs, just by cultivating these friendships and being intuitive and talking to people about their dreams and their interests and their taste, essentially. It's a lot of hustle. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's just hustling to meet people, to stay on their radar, lots of emails, functions, events. I'm going to be going to the Game Developers Conference in a couple of weeks, and I'm planning meetings right now, so lots of meetings. Follow-up, it's a hard hustle. It's not easy. Yeah, but you seem to be doing it really well. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. My name is Joel LaViolette. I'm a musician. I have several bands. We travel internationally. I also teach traditional Zimbabwean music. I think the obstacle that prevented me from jumping to Dorico right away was just that it's so new. I really wanted to watch it and see what features existed. I love just how clean and clear the output is. I do most of my composing in Cubase, but the notation aspect of Cubase isn't as pretty or as immediate as it is in Dorico. For me, working within Cubase and then being able to export the XML and drop that right into Dorico is just awesome. Just instantly have something that looks great, that my musicians can read easily. I'm not having to spend hours and hours having to edit the notation to, to make it convey what I'm trying to say. I don't know if this is a benefit or a feature, but I, I just think this is so cool. Something that's really awesome is a lot of times I'll write parts within Cubase that, that are pretty complex and then I can bring that into Dorico, and then depending on the level of my students, I can really easily just highlight several measures and then simplify the rhythmic structure of it. And Dorico is really smart with how it handles that. I'll create a few different flows, and then I can have more and more simplified versions of the parts depending on the students that I'm working with. I'd say anybody that is a, is a composer or is a musician that's needing to quickly write charts for their band to play, I would say it's worth the price of admission. It's just so fast and so easy to make different variations and things. So I'd say anybody that, if that sounds like you, definitely go for Dorico. I really appreciate that Steinberg has put the effort and the money into bringing in a great team to do this. It's really great to just see that, that there's a fresh approach and that those people on that team are being supported. You know, and if you go to the forums there on Steinberg, you see it's really active and you see that, that the developers are actually right there answering questions and you know, helping guys and ladies like me out who you know, might not even be coming into this from the engraving world. So it, it's great. I'm really happy that they're doing it. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. 
So go and do that. I am have been using the program and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to dorico.com slash TPC. One thing that you had just said in that story, which is a great story, by the way, is that you were the only woman at this event. And I'm not trying to make a qualifying statement here, but most composers active in media are men. And when you niche it down into the gaming world, it becomes even more male centric. And yet you've been able to get some pretty high profile games. And I know that there are a lot of female composers who listen to the podcast. And I want to know what is that like for you to forge ahead as a woman in this field? Well, I should say things are changing right now because there are a couple of very powerful women composers who are doing studio, top studio games. Some of the biggest titles actually are scored by women, but this is just a very recent development. Um, I would say, and that's the kind of advice I give to young women, always be supremely professional because it's the music that gets us hired. Ultimately, the music has to be very professional and the right match. I work with people well. I listen very closely. I ask questions. I'm never afraid to ask questions. I would say just like a mixture between being very professional and kind of being always supportive and kind. I don't crack jokes. I mean, I can work with people who are kind of cracking jokes all the time, but I myself am always somewhat, you know, reserved, but also, no, let me take this. I'm I'm approachable. I come across as somebody who is like helpful and wants to do the best. And I would say just great music, being professional, being available, working easily with people, like working well and fluently has helped me. Sometimes I get frustrated. I have to hide that frustration and sublimate it to my own composing. Sometimes I get, you know, sometimes it does not go my way. I still have to calm myself down and just remember it's all about their projects. They have a vision. My job is to support the vision. It's not about my music. So the ego is checked at the door always. And even if I feel like my feelings are hurt, I still have to remember the privilege to work with somebody on their project. It's their vision. I'm only contributing that emotional aspect of the experience. So these are things, again, these are attitudes I kind of learned by the hard knocks of life. What helps me is that I want to be seen, and I always come across as a very positive, creative person who does not have like any sort of attitudes, but it's like always positive and a problem solver. And I think this all helps. So it's a combination between the power of the music and also that healthy attitude of just being a collaborative artist and saying yes to all sorts of problems and assignments and just kind of being willing to walk the extra mile to please the client. Mm -hmm. So I think this has helped me. It seems like that's also part of the Panka brand, right? Well, I mean, the brand is changing. I used to do more work helping the others, and right now I'm kind of focusing more on select work for clients and my own passion projects because I feel compelled to create my own music. So I would say one part of being an artist is that you're continuously reinventing yourself. It's an ongoing, continuous project. And this is actually something that really excites me. I'm happy to like always be reinventing myself, always trying new things. And one thing is for sure, all the composers who work in these collaborative media fields of entertainment have to be available to give their all to their collaborators. I mean, it's about the project. It's not about my music or my ideas. Right. It's about me supporting a project. Tell me about one of the most rewarding projects that you ever got to do. Oh, God, they're so, they're all wonderful. There's so few projects that have been, not, not you know, not utterly inspiring. <laughs> um, let me just, let me think. Well, I mean, most recently I worked on music for a big exhibit called Heroes and Legends. It's going to be on a permanent display at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Basically, a friend of mine through the game industry recommended me, and he obviously this is all NDA, so he couldn't tell me what the project was, but he said, you know, put together a folder of music that has your astronaut music and your hero music and your action music and send it to me. And I kind of thought to myself, this is going to be awesome. Whatever this is, this sounds so awesome, and I want it so much. So I told him, not only I'm going to give you a folder of past music, but let me sit down and compose spec demos. 
So I composed a spec demo. And I think by that time I had signed the NDA so he could tell me what this was. And he said, it's just an exhibit about the American astronauts. So I composed uh, five minutes of spec demo music. It was really inspiring, and I so much wanted this job, but I obviously hadn't been hired yet. So I sent the music, and, and then he loved it so much, he put it as a temp score behind the 3D cinematics, the three films. And then the whole entire studio got to hear it, because they have these weekly presentations. And then they said, well, we want to hire this person. And then I got hired, and there were interviews, and took a long time, and I continued to compose all throughout that process. I just loved the music. And then we worked very closely with my supervisors. But the point I'm getting at is that this is one example where I showed initiative, and I really wanted this job, and I wanted to try to find a way to really get it. And that way was composing music without being asked completely on my own doing these spec demos. I had a fantastic boss. His name is Rick Morris. He's like an Oscar-nominated sound designer and my friend Jesse James who plugged me in. I was getting really great feedback. And obviously they had feedback because that's the nature of the beast. Every time when I work with collaborators, there's always feedback. You know, sometimes it's like very small tweaks or small revisions. Sometimes, you know, this is not working for us. Write us a different theme. You know, this is just not hitting it. And I have to be always cool and say, yes, I will write you a new scene. And in the case of the exhibit, all the music was loved, except one who had to be pretty substantially revised, which I did. And then it was a happy collaboration. We worked remotely there in Florida. I was in Los Angeles. I do remote work all the time. Essentially, most of my collaborators, except on feature films, are somewhere else, in Seattle, in Montreal, and Communication becomes really essential. Communication over email, Skype sometimes, mostly it's email. File management becomes essential because I have to be really careful about the files that go out, the files that come in. So just managing the job becomes a big part of the job itself. So I think it's really ultimately about collaborating, about listening closely to the vision of your collaborators and just being very specific and kind of very rigorous about the process, the workflow, the technology. There's a lot of rigor in what I do. I have to be very disciplined how I manage my files, how I manage the workflow, mm -hmm. timeline. So it's hard work, but I love it. When you demo a project, you're using sample libraries or are you investing in hiring musicians? Mostly I uh, would use samples. Occasionally I have recorded like maybe one live player to sweeten the demos. I haven't had a chance to demo on a studio film, in which case I most likely will have some kind of small orchestra, but I also produce pretty well with samples, and I have a wonderful writing partner who does amazing mixing, mixes, synth programming. So it really is entirely up to the composer, and it usually depends on the scope of the project and how much I want that particular project. But it is a common practice, especially right now in Hollywood amongst composers, when they demo on a big high profile project to actually hire live musicians, even for the demo. But they could be spending thousands of dollars then on spec. Yeah, well this is considered business investment. We invest in ourselves as artists and in our business. And this is where the business acumen comes because you have to run this as a business. You can't think, oh, I'm not getting paid. No, it's not about that. I'll get paid on a different job. There's one instance I um, can only kind of vaguely talk about it because I've signed NDA, but um, I demoed on a AAA project for a long time because I really wanted it. But then the studio killed the project, so basically disappeared. And that's okay. I'm grateful for the relationship, but I also paid a lot of money for the demos because I was working with somebody else who's a more electronic artist. But uh, it's just the cost of doing business. That's how I have to think of it. It's an investment in the relationship, investment in just having more music in a genre I've never worked with before. And I can't think of how much money I'm going to spend because I'll earn the money on some other job. But I'm invested in this particular job, and it didn't go through, which happens in business and in entertainment. And I just have to keep moving forward, not be too upset about that. And now you have those tracks that you can use to demo in the future. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or give them to libraries yep. or 
try to monetize them, but mostly use them as demos for the future, exactly. And that's worth it to me. What's worth it the most is the relationship and the fact that I composed music in a genre, which I haven't had a chance to do before on a job. That's why, that's also the reason I'm doing these uh, passion projects, my own CDs, because they give me a chance to produce music at a very high level of, you know, of artistry that I could send for a demo on a future job. Right. Yeah, I think it's really important to always have a passion project. If you don't, then you end up writing for other people all the time and you're not as fulfilled artistically. Yeah, very true. Uh, very, very true. Yeah, so, um, I mean, and, and this is exactly what I learned sort of from the knocks of life. And I didn't know, I didn't, I mean, I, I wish I had started doing these passion projects much earlier in my career, but I only started just a couple of years ago. But, you know, I'm learning. So I just released my third passion project on the biggest soundtrack label called Zorez Saraband and getting fantastic feedback and reviews. So I'm really happy about that. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. I always, or I like to ask a lot of my guests if they could give three business tips that composers could go out and do today in order to move their career forward. And you've already given us a tremendous one, which was develop real relationships, develop friendships. And I'm wondering if you have two more. Yeah. So number one, develop real, genuine human relationships and connect with people on a humanistic level. Engage them about their dreams, their passions. You know, don't shove business cards in people's hands. Instead, make real friendships. That's number one. Number two, write awesome music. I mean, sit down and write something personal and powerful and emotional and memorable and sweeping. So write powerful music. This is something you can sit down and do today because it's our music and our relationships that are going to propel us forward. I mean, people ask me, how do you get jobs? That's how you get jobs. It's your relationships, it's your credits and your music. There is no shortcut. There is no magic trick. It's really, I mean, we are in a business of people opening doors for us. Every single meaningful job I've ever gotten is because somebody trusted me and was energized by my talent to open a door for me. And I've opened a door myself to many, many people. So the second bit of advice would be write really awesome music because you have to energize the people to open that door for you. And the third bit of advice is be very healthy. Health is so important. I don't ever expect my assistants to pull all-nighters, which is such a big part of our culture, but I totally discourage people because for me, health and strength and focus are the most important things because we need that. We shouldn't run ourselves into the ground from exhaustion because when you're exhausted, this is when mistakes happen and people cannot be on their best because they're tired. So I'm very big on health and lifestyle management and not doing like stupid things like staying up all night and working 48 hours nonstop. That's kind of just really destructive. So I would say the three bits of advice is relationships, music, and health. Have you had a journey for yourself of moving towards being healthy? Was there a time in your life when you were making the decisions you wouldn't make now? Oh, yeah. yeah no, I, I abused sleep deprivation very badly, and it really hurt me. I regret that. I almost really destroyed my brain from continuous chronic sleep deprivation and working crazy hours. It got to a point where I was just going to get some horrible chronic disease, and I got very close to a brink of annihilation, and that's when I decided, okay, enough. This is just not going to – this is just stupid. My brain is valuable. So how I mitigated that problem is I started farming out work and I built fantastic teams and I still farm out a lot of work because I don't care to earn a lot of money. I pay a lot of people to help me so that I can have a regimen and uh, be healthy. And if this means I'm never going to be super rich, I don't care because I don't care about material wealth. I care about my health. Yeah. And also I have a family, I have a child and I need to be alive to be a good parent. So really that whole management of projects started to really happen when I understood the importance of my own well-being. But many years ago, when I first got out into Hollywood, I worked 20-hour days and slept four hours for weeks. And that was not... Yeah. There's a lot of new research that shows 
how much damage we do to ourselves by just losing just three or four hours of sleep a night has long-term damage to our brain and our ability to be creative and to think clearly. It's quite scary, actually. Yeah, and the entertainment business, both in games and film, has a culture of crunch and long hours and sleep deprivation, and I'm just completely against. And in my practice right now, because I do have a lot of assistants and helpers and team, I just never expect people to work past midnight. I actually demand that they go to bed Midnight, I go to bed just before midnight, and we kind of all stay on a very steady regimen. And basically, financially, I have to pay a lot of people to help me with my jobs because they come in a very erratic flow. Sometimes I have dry spells, sometimes I have a couple of jobs overlapping. But again, the finances for me, it's just a means for me to run my business, and I pay a lot of people. But the health is non-negotiable, and I really encourage people, and I kind of talk about this a lot because... It is very important. As a creative artist, the two most important things are concentration and memory, because that's how we create. We access our memory banks, and we have to be focused for many long hours a day to stay on task and to stay focused on that project. And when you don't sleep well, the first thing that go is the concentration and the memory. And I've experienced this many times. Like if I haven't slept well, I'm totally just like, I can't focus. I go on Facebook and waste time. So yeah, after many years of kind of doing it the wrong way, I finally learned to be regimented, take care of my health and run a team and kind of run a pretty tight ship Hmm. with farming out work and running a team. Oh, I love it. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about today that I failed to ask you? Oh, I wanted to tell you about my new passion project. It's a CD released on the Royal Sarah Band, which is released by Universal Music. It's called Rebirth of Vid. It has an unusual structure. It has four mini soundtracks, and each one tells a different story. I would encourage your listeners to check it out because it's powerful music, and it's my favorite genres. So the first mini soundtrack is futuristic science fiction. The second one is a period piece, like the kind of stuff I haven't done. The third one is supernatural, um, supernatural time travel kind of thing. And the fourth is a surprise. <laughs> you have to check it out. Haha. Uh-huh. I'm looking at it right now on Varisa's website, and that's some pretty cool album art. Yeah, yeah. I also commissioned the art. So that's my newest project. I also have a feature film called AGA, A-G-A, that is closing the Berlin Film Festival this weekend. Wow. I composed the music for it. And I have another feature that got released on Sony Pictures DVD. It's called Devil's Whisper. It's a supernatural thriller, supernatural horror, really good story, kind of coming of age story about a young guy who is haunted by demons. But that's kind of a expression of his repressed memories of trauma. So that's also out on DVD, Devil's Whisper. I have, of course, my Woman Astronaut CD, which was also released by Veraz, and that's the CD that got me the NASA job, which is pretty fantastic. And of course, if you ever go to Orlando, Florida, check out the Kennedy Space Center, check out the Heroes and Legends new building, like a new attraction, because I'm exceptionally proud to have scored such a enduring and iconic project about the American astronauts. To me, space is huge since childhood because my dad is an engineer, so we learned about cosmos and space and airplanes and rockets, of course, (laughs) since we were children. So I have a lot of projects going on, and I'm grateful to be in this line of work. It's a wonderful career. It's a very difficult career and takes a long time, tremendous amount of tenacity and vision and focus to be able to turn it into career. But I'm grateful and I count my blessings every day. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today, Panka. I've enjoyed this conversation a great deal. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention. And this is an honor to be speaking with you. And thank you for great questions. And I'm thankful for your time. And I wish all the best to your listeners. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. The brand new Dorico Pro 2 introduces best-in-class support for composing to picture. Using the same powerful new video engine found in Cubase and Nuendo, attach a video to your project, play it back via the dedicated video window, and see thumbnails in play mode. Add markers at crucial points in the action and display them in the score. 
Use the new tempo automation controls in play mode to line markers up with beats, or find a tempo for the whole cue. New tools in play mode allow you to edit the tempo and dynamics of your music graphically, applying default curves to provide more nuance to gradual tempo and dynamic changes. Add lanes for MIDI controllers and draw data to bring your music to life. With Dorico 2's new automation tools, you can add realism and nuance to the virtual performance of your music, taking it one step closer to the stage or concert hall without leaving your music notation software. And that's only the beginning. Check out the brand new Dorico website at dorico.com slash tpc to find out more.